Yeah. Yeah. Good evening. It is Monday, May Monday, May 3rd, 2010. Welcome to Behind the Badge. I'm your host tonight, Sergeant Tom Lorenz. It's been about two years since our last show. Unfortunately, the budget has caused us to reflect on how we best spend our monies to police the city. However, uh, in the coming uh, months, we hope to be back on some type of schedule, or at least when there's something important that we need to get out to the community, uh, maybe we'll try to find a way to get back on the air as, as much as we can. We, after, after all, believe uh, that a well-informed community does so much better in partnering um, with the police department. In our case, uh, we are one of the safest cities in the United States, and we'd like to stay that way. Tonight, we have a very special guest. We have a brand new police chief. It's our 17th uh, chief in over 100 years. Um, he is Chief Ronald L. DePampa. Uh, he was sworn in on January 7th, 2010, and I'd just like to introduce Ron DePompa and let him introduce himself. Well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and it is uh, uh, an exciting venue to reach out to the community and say hello to everybody, and uh, glad you're joining us tonight. And uh, it's, a, it's an honor for me to be uh, named Chief of Glendale, uh, largely because uh, I started my law enforcement career here 32 years ago. So it's, uh, it's been a long uh, uh, engagement here in, in Glendale, and I'm very honored to now uh, finish my career as, as a chief. Um, but you know, my, my family grew up here, uh, or lived in, in the community. I grew up here. And so there's something unique, I think, about when you can uh, actually uh, have your law enforcement career in, in your hometown. And so that's been uh, exceptionally rewarding for me. But uh, over the 32 years, I've had an opportunity to uh, really work a wide variety of different assignments and, and command uh, just about every operational area of the police department. And so I think it's really uh, given me a, a, a good insight into, into how the department works and, and how it is situated in, in terms of meeting the public safety needs of the community. Um, so I'm very honored and excited about the uh, the uh, future, and uh, despite many uh, significant challenges ahead, um, I think we're in, we're going to have uh, 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 some good opportunities to really make a difference in terms of public safety. Well, I welcome you here. Uh, I've worked for you for many years. I've been here for 26 years now. So, in one capacity or another, I think I've worked for you uh, in some capacity. Um, and so I know I've enjoyed it, and now being able to work direct, directly for you is really great. As a reminder to our viewing public here in Glendale, uh, this is a live call-in show. We are starting about 30 minutes late, so I apologize to the viewers that have been waiting. Uh, we had to wait till the uh, commission finished first, uh, but we are live uh, tonight. Uh, this is Monday, May 3rd, 2010. The phone number is 818 548 Three three four four. This is your opportunity to personally speak with Chief Ronda Pampa. I know many of you like to call in and maybe talk to the chief, but frankly, sometimes when he's policing the city and there's over 200,000 people here, he just can't get to everyone all the time. But for those of you that do get through tonight, you'll have an opportunity to talk to Chief De Pampa. Our topics tonight that we'd like to stay uh, on topic with because an hour goes by very quickly will be some of the challenges that he's uh, been facing as the new chief here in Glendale. Uh, that goes from the budget to dealing with the California pr prison reform um, and the significant steps that he has taken um, in regards to technology, both for you and the public and for the men and women in the police department. It's kind of a uh, what they call a force multiplier when you're able to have real-time information so you can do your job that much more quickly. At the end of the show tonight, we're going to unveil a new program that he's brought to the police department. It's something that's used in other police departments, but we're finally catching up. Um, and it's called Crime Mapping. And you won't want to miss that because it's something that you're going to be able to actually use in your own home, on your laptop, and access information. 
Anyways, that'll uh, come up at the end of the show. Again, our phone number is 818-548-3344. We're looking forward to some phone calls tonight. Anyways, Chief, um, I mentioned that we had some challenges to look at. You certainly, when you get appointed, uh, it was kind of all thrown into your lap here. Uh, I do remember a few uh, uh, council meetings where city council challenged you. I think one councilman said, shake the etch a sketch and said, take this back and let's start all over and come back with a new plan, and you did. Um, if you could, uh, why don't you tell us some of the challenges that you're going to be facing here? Absolutely, Tom, and, and, uh, and certainly uh, uh, we have been faced with uh, some significant budget uh, challenges over the last two years. Uh, certainly the, uh, the economic recession has uh, affected the city of Glendale and, and affected our operational budgets. So uh, first and foremost is that we have uh, reduced our force by 17 sworn officers over the last two fiscal years. And that's something that the community probably was not real aware of. Uh, but in order to uh, to uh, uh, meet our, our deficit and, and balance the budget citywide, uh, part of that resp uh, responsibility fell on, on the shoulders of the police department. So uh, with the reduction of 17 sworn, it's, it's made it uh, all the more challenging for us to um, proactively address crime trends and, and public safety issues as, as they arise. So we, we really had to re-examine how we police the community and, and come up with some innovative ways to, in essence, change how we do our business. And uh, so that uh, was the city council's challenge uh, for us. And uh, fortunately, I think we've, we've got some good strategies underway. Good. And you know what? Um, I know that uh, being one of the safest cities in the country is very important, not only to you as the police chief, because this is your police department, sure. and uh, the city of Glendale and the citizens here are, is giving you that permission to police their city and, and be the leader. But uh, obviously the residents here, the people that have businesses here, the people that go to school here want to make sure they're safe. And uh, what are our stats right now uh, well, in regards and, to and, safety? And, and that's a, a very good question, and uh, because sometimes in an economic recession you expect an escalation of crime. But uh, actually, we, last year was, was uh, very favorable to us. We experienced about a 14% decrease in violent crime and uh, about a, an 8% uh, decrease in property crime. So as a result, uh, it really helped to fortify our position um, in terms of a national ranking and state ranking for cities that have a population uh, of over 100,000. And so we use those two rankings to gauge our, our public safety um, position, if you will. And so we've, uh, we've been able to maintain our, our uh, position in the top ten in both those rankings. Yeah, I can see that the chart that we have up on the screen there is that uh, uh, the national top ten, we see, uh, we, have, we see a handful of California uh, uh, cities, and then we see some uh, New York and uh, North Carolina. but. Uh, we are definitely within the top ten of uh, the safest cities. Right. And then in the California top ten, it appears we're, yeah, about number one, two, three, four, five, six safest cities in the uh, state of California. Do you want to explain these numbers? Because I think some of the viewers might have questions about these numbers, 197 population versus what we believe to be yeah. actually around 207. And, and, and when, when we do... Uh, comparative crime analysis from city to city, both state and, and nationally, they use uh, uh, census data. And, and obviously our last census was uh, 10 years ago. So the, the, the data is uh, um, somewhat understated by what we know to be our actual population. Our actual population uh, should be in excess of 200,000. And so um, if we hopefully with the uh, new census information, uh, when that is factored in, given a, a larger population, our, our crime rate should even improve uh, a little more. That's, that's fantastic. And for the people out there that uh, this, we're, we're doing the census now, and the city has a committee that follows up on it from understand we're doing very well in our returns in the census. So if you haven't done it, please fill it out, because it's not only about counting you, 
It's about the amount of money that comes back to the city of Glendale from the federal government in, in regards to public safety issues, to health care, to education, et cetera. So it's based on numbers. And if we don't report our numbers, we're not going to get the appropriate amount of funding. Um, anyways, Chief, some of the things that uh, uh, we also uh, have been dealing with is now that we have kind of overcome uh, some uh, issues with the staffing that you've had to deal with, uh, the shortfalls there, uh, we have the uh, uh, California prison system and, and, and the state of California who has budget problems. And we have the early re release program or reform act where we're actually putting prisoners back on streets sooner than we should probably. E exactly, Tom. And, and, and that is perhaps one of our, our, our greatest threats, uh, I feel, to... Uh, our future public safety, and, and it's, it's really twofold. Uh, certainly the, uh, the state had to balance its budget, and uh, they were fa facing quite a deficit at the state level. Part of the strategies to do that uh, was to reduce the, uh, the population uh, of the prison system, and, uh, uh, and they anticipate that that could be anywhere from 18,000 to 20,000 uh, felony prisoners from state prison released early. Wow. Um, and in addition, there was a federal court ruling that uh, uh, mandates uh, the Ca California Department of uh, Corrections and Rehabilitation to reduce even further uh, based on overcrowding, uh, overcrowded conditions. And so the net effect is that uh, we can anticipate a significant early release of, of felons from state prison uh, back to LA County and research indicates that uh, the recidivism rate is very high for these early releases as high as 70 percent within the first three years so um, what that will equate to is obviously an impact to uh, crime rates here in the, in the county and certainly in the city of Glendale and uh, um, you know ultimately uh, be a real challenge for us yeah, and I've, I've noticed that there might be, uh, well, what I've heard a lot of in dealing with the public, I've heard a lot that there's going to be issues in regards to no supervision. Uh, they won't even have to give an address where when people came back to the community, we knew where they lived. They answered to a parole officer. Maybe there was com chemical testing. Um, in some cases, there was some specific type of monitoring. But frankly, there's a huge recidivism rate, and if we don't know where they are, it becomes a bigger problem for law enforcement. It makes it all, all the more challenging. And, and certainly in the past, we had uh, supervision and, and conditions um, that helped us manage this population. But uh, with the non-revocable parole status um, for many of these early releases, uh, it's going to take our ability away from us in order to apply those management tools. Yes, and I, I have so, another graph here, and it talks about some of the things. but. Uh, I, in regards to the people that say don't go back, they have the non-revocable parole, as they call it, um, and we re-arrest them on a new charge, uh, how many times do you think they may commit a crime or actually get caught by the time the district attorney, now we're going through the whole process again, right. whereas if they were on parole, we would have just sent them back. Right, and, and, and uh, again, uh, uh, research indicates that um, in addition to the 70% recidivism rate, that prior to that arrest for uh, or rearrest, that uh, they will uh, the typical uh, early releasee will have committed anywhere from 12 to 15 felonies, and so um, that they're not arrested for. So certainly it 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 creates a, a significant crime concern, and that's why the having the con supervision and and conditions and and good data on where these people live and um, made it very uh, beneficial for law enforcement to, to help deter that. That's good. You know, actually, we do have a caller here, and I don't like to keep our callers holding too long. Um, I have Tony in Glendale here and actually is asking a question about parolees. It's about uh, Task Force for Early Release Parolees. So why don't we uh, take uh, Tony's call here? Tony, welcome to Behind the Badge. What's your question? Thank you so much. I understand that there's going to be a task force formed between Glendale, Burbank, Pasadena, and the U.S. Marshals to deal with this problem. What would the task force actually be doing? Tony, that's a great question, and the chief will go. I'm going to go ahead and put you on hold here. 
Yeah, and, and Tony, that, that is a, gr a great question. And in anticipation of, of this early release uh, uh, proposal, um, the uh, cities of Burbank, Pasadena, and Glendale uh, formed together in partnership with the U.S. Marshals uh, to bring a, uh, a, a unit uh, into our region that will will focus on um, tracking down fugitives and and will largely focus on what we call parolees at large um, and those are parolees that have violated their terms and, and conditions of their parole uh, they're they're typically outstanding and on the run and and in many cases uh, very responsible for a majority of our our crime trends and sprees that, that occur in our area. So this unit has been very, very successful in tracking these people down and, and, and bringing them back into custody. Because the, the, the basic premise is, is that if you can bring good accountability to criminal behavior, uh, then you can deter crime and you can improve public safety. So, um, so this is one area where the three, uh, the Tri-City uh, region has banded together to, to try to bring a very valuable tool uh, uh, to all three cities that, that we can use on a regular basis. But uh, very good question. Thank you, Tony. I appreciate the call. Uh, Chief, we've got a lot to discuss tonight, and I don't want to shorten uh, any subject matter because I think just as much uh, that we, anything we talk about tonight is going to be uh, important. But some of the things that are going to deal with this parolee issue and, and some of the issues with the uh, shortage of staff uh, comes to uh, some new strategies right. that uh, you have engaged in here, and some of them are actually some of the uh, actually fascinating stuff that I know the men and women of the department actually feel um, are very appreciative to because it gives them um, some accountability, some responsibility, and the buck stops with them. It's yeah. them. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want what are uh, I've heard some things in regards to uh, geographic commander stuff, but you have three specific things that yeah. I know you've talked about. And, and, and just kind of three main uh, strategic directions that, that we're looking at is, is one is, is creating a much uh, a greater geographic accountability uh, where, where our personnel are, are really in charge of a defined area and responsible for what go, goes on in that area. And, and that's ultimately led to our area command, which I'll talk about momentarily. But then in support of that, a strategy is the idea of, of providing our personnel with timely information uh, through very robust crime analysis. And uh, that's an important part of the equation. And then also bringing in what, what we call enabling technology, things that will help us do our job better, um, such as uh, the uh, proposed DNA laboratory here in our local region, uh, the use of uh, video surveillance, uh, in in uh, key parts of the uh, city, specifically the downtown area. So these types of technologies will, will help us do our job more efficiently. You know, I'm actually playing on the computer here, and I know we'll go to in a second here. Uh, if Actually, if we go to that uh, the, the Internet site, if you go to uh, our police webpage, which is, uh, 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 and on the left side of our police website, you'll see uh, Geographic Command. You click on that. And you'll come up with a map. The map is right now divided up into four different geographic commands. Uh, do you want to introduce the four areas? No, I yeah. think that yeah, it would be and terrific for the viewing public to see that and know a little bit about what it entails. One, okay, I'll start with the North Command here. This one is one of your commanders here. Yeah, and that's uh, Lieutenant Ian Grimes. And, and if I might just give a little uh, uh, preface here, um, the idea is is that this geographic or area command takes uh, a commander uh, and, and puts uh, him or her in charge of that, of that specific area. And then they're, they're responsible um, for serving kind of like the mini chief of police for that area uh, for, for two main reasons, Tom. One is, is uh, to be that single point of contact for the community and neighborhoods. Uh, but secondly, to be the person that really keeps their eye on the ball in terms of what's happening in, in their areas so we can be very responsive and timely in, in addressing issues and concerns. So uh, uh, again, the, we're, we're currently divided in, in, into four geographic commands. The, uh, there'll be a fifth downtown area command in the not too distant future, um, but uh, currently we're dealing with the four. 
And so in the north, uh, we have Lieutenant Ian Grimes. Our west area commander is uh, Lieutenant uh, Susan Hain. Our south area commander is Lieutenant Brian Cohen. And our east area commander is Lieutenant Tony Fuchsia. And uh, these are all very, very capable uh, uh, command staff, very experienced, uh, very good at problem solving, and uh, will be responsible for reaching out to their communities and, and developing uh, that personal relationship that makes uh, um, them all that more effective in responding to the needs of their areas. And, and if you continue looking at these websites here down below, you'll see the map of the area where you might fall mm -hmm. into as a business owner or a resident. You'll have the area commander, you see Tony Fuchsia, there's a little bio about him. He's actually uh, got a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice from the North Master's degree in Criminal Justice, Boston University, a doctorate from Glendale University of College of Law. Um, he's got his email address there, got his phone number there. Sergeant John Gilkerson, who runs our COPS unit, that had to be uh, uh, kind of redesigned this past year under the budget issue, but now that he's answering directly to the lieutenants, you got a lead officer. That lead officer works with you. It's the people in the community working directly with the officer. And you can see the phone numbers and email addresses are all there uh, connected directly to uh, the people that you need to talk to. Uh, I think what's most importantly, important about this, I wish I had it in the community I live because frankly, is if I had an issue in my neighborhood, if I had an issue in my neighborhood and I called the police, I would get a police officer today uh, a week from now, I'd get a different police officer, and then three weeks a month down the line, I'd get another police officer, and there's no continuity. But with this, ultimately, the lieutenant for that area is responsible, correct? That's, that's exactly right. And the staff uh, that, that works uh, the patrol areas um, under those lieutenants are, uh, there's going to be much greater consistency in their assignments, so there will be uh, a much more likelihood that the same officer will be dealing with the same area and the same problems over, over a given period of time. That's great. Uh, I just want to remind everybody this is a live call-in show. If you're just tuning in, it is uh, Monday, May 3rd, 2010, and our phone number here, if you'd like to talk to Chief Rhonda Pompa, is 818-548-3344. Uh, next, uh, some of the things in order to for your people and your lieutenants to be able to have that accountability, they need to know what they're accountable for exactly. when it comes to the types of crimes. Right. It really, I guess it doesn't do any good if it's late information. So you've been big in regards to timely information. And what is it that you've developed here with your staff that uh, that you're unveiling? Actually, we've been doing it actually for about a month we, or two now. We, we have, and, and, and this is really exciting. and and. Uh, the program is called iLeads, and it stands for uh, Information-Led Enforcement and Accountability Data. And what it really equates to is, a, is our effort to bring robust crime analysis uh, to our policing effort and ensure that we're getting information out to the commanders and out to the area officers and the, and the patrol uh, districts uh, in almost a real-time fashion. And the, and the benefit of that is that with good information, uh, they can then plan their daily strategies and be responsive to, to issues. If there's a crime trend or crime spree, they're going to know about it, um, and they're going to be on top of it, and they're going to bring uh, the resources to resolve that issue. And so uh, we've had tremendous success so far with, with this program. Now, I, I've actually seen some of this work to some extent. Now, I've been on the line level for a while, working upstairs with mm -hmm. all of you on, up on the fourth floor. Um, but uh, this information, when an officer actually writes a report, takes it from a citizen, they're actually typing it into the computer. Mm -hmm. And once that's transferred electronically to the supervisor in the station who reads and approves, that goes then to the records bureau. It does. Yeah. And from there, it's uploaded into this. That's right. And, and so the... Uh, the crime analysis software um, will, will grab that data as soon as it's available through our computer system and, and then begin to populate uh, our geographic locations based on those incidents. Um, so it gives us, in essence, a real picture of, of what's going on. So like uh, I just had a map up a second ago, but that map that we were looking at uh, actually populated some crimes that we can see by the icons 
And we can look at trends based on dates, right. months, week, time of day, time of day. weekends. Right. And then um, eventually we'll come back to crime mapping here. But uh, this information is not only used by those in the field, but we have to have some interface between other right. members of our department. And, and, and it's all about teamwork and, and sharing information and working together. And so uh, not only will the area commanders use this tool on a daily basis, but uh, then we've started something called our weekend crime uh, meetings. And this brings together uh, command level staff and operational folks uh, from liter literally every corner of the department. Um, but most specifically uh, from our patrol division, our traffic uh, division, our investigators, and uh, our crime analysis folks, and we'll really use a, a, that time to review the latest uh, information we have for the, for the prior seven days. So what's going on in relationship to different crime trends, to calls for service, to traffic issues. Um, and the area commanders can then begin to work on identifying suspects or strategies for which they're going to address the, the problems or issues. And, uh, and we've had remarkable successes to date. And I, we've got one up there that's a, a very good uh, case. This was in regards to several commercial burglaries they're seen on the screen. It was breaking into uh, liquor stores, family-owned liquor stores, little markets and stuff like that, and they were stealing lottery tickets. And from the information that was garnered from some of these meetings, the forensic evidence, et cetera, and working with some other agencies, they, uh, they did a very good job in tracking them down and, and catching them. And, this is one of those cases. And, and that's exactly the point. And this is a classic example of how it works because this information was actually identified and shared in a week in crime meeting and the area commanders worked with our special enforcement detail and, and our burglary unit to, to really um, jump on the trend quickly. And so uh, literally in a matter of days, they had the responsible uh, suspects in custody. Yes, yeah, so that's really great. amazing. And we ended up going to L.A. to uh, get that information. Uh, now, not only are we going to use our local data, but we intend to uh, take all this information from all readily available res or sources, I should say. I think I want to picture this. Uh, I know you're planning on building uh, some kind of war room of sorts that where you'd actually take a room and you'd have all these video monitors and screens like something we'd see on TV, NCIS or, or something like that. Right. And that's where we're going. That's where we're headed, hopefully. And it's hopefully not, not far off. But, but that's really the key is to bring in information from a wide variety of different data sources to help us solve crime. Uh, so when we uh, see that geographic uh, depiction of, a, for instance, a residential burglary spree up in one of our neighborhoods, well, then we can overlay uh, information about parolees or about uh, re recent arrestees that may have that same method of operation related to their crimes or a variety of different uh, uh, data sources that, that may help us identify the suspects responsible. That's great. And then um, one of the things that uh, we've been looking at, and it's kind of a highlight of what uh, uh, is kind of sister to this, is obviously this is all internal information, but we're also looking at uh, stuff that's uh, readily available to the public. Right. And that being that being uh, crimemapping.com. And from what I understand from your crime analysis unit, it actually went live today. That's right. Did so you want to talk about crime mapping? Yeah, a little I, bit? because I think we have a video we'll show in a second. But why don't you go ahead and talk I think about it's, it? It's very important, and and when we talk about strategic directions. Um, especially in, in, in light of our um, uh, budget reductions, the community and public uh, and their relationship and partnership with us becomes more critical than ever. Uh, so we really need to ensure that our public is informed and engaged with what's going on in their areas and what public safety issues they, uh, they might be experiencing. So crimemapping.com is an avenue to accomplish that. So much as uh, the, in the same way that area commanders get almost real-time information about crime in their areas, so will the public. And they will use the, this avenue uh, through the website, crimemapping.com. They'll be able to uh, log on to that website, pull up their area, and, and get a, a geographic depiction of the crime that's occurring in their neighborhoods. 
And, and it, it accomplishes a couple things. One, it, it creates a level of awareness that we need because the public is our eyes and ears out there. And number two, hopefully it'll open up a, a dialogue between them and their area commander about what's going on. So uh, we see it as a real win-win for both the public and, and the department. Sounds good. Why don't we go ahead and roll into that video here. And actually, as a view in public, you'll be able to see how this is done. And we'll talk about it a little bit. There's our, we have some disclaimers for it. And uh, whenever we're ready. The Glendale Police Department is happy to announce that it will soon be able to show residents of the city the crimes that are happening in their neighborhood. This information will be available via a free publicly accessible website called crimemapping.com. The site can be seen by typing in www.crimemapping.com. The site is easy to navigate. To start, just click California on the map to see a list of agencies and find Glendale Police, California. You will immediately see a map of the city populated with icons showing recent crimes. Clicking on any icon will bring up details about that incident. You can zoom and move around the map manually or enter a specific address in the search field above the map. Results can be filtered by crime type and date range. To determine which types of crimes you would like to see, click the Crimes Type tab. You can hover the mouse cursor over each icon to see the crime it represents. Icons can be checked individually, or you can select Clear All or Check All to change them all at once. The map will update immediately. If there is a particular incident you are searching for and know approximately when it happened, click on the Dates tab. Simply select a start date and an end date, and the results will be restricted to that range. Please note, CrimeMapping.com only holds 90 days of information. CrimeMapping.com can also show neighborhood crime trends in chart format. Just click the Trend Report button on the right side. To see a list view, click the Detailed Report button. Clicking any item on the list will take you directly to that incident on the map. Crime mapping is your tool to help you stay informed about what's going on in your neighborhood. Well, I would hope and think that that's fascinating. Um, I've actually pulled it up on my computer here. And if I can find Glendale, California, I'll click on that. And, you know, one of the things that some people first asked me when they first saw this, let it load up here, uh, is that, wow, there looks like there's a, a lot of crime or something there because of uh, how populated it is. These are actual crimes you're looking at here that have occurred, but uh, if you go into the city in this area here and you zoom in, you can see when you're going zooming into the city here, uh, it's not right on top of each other as some might think. The uh, purple icons there, Chief, uh, that's the narcotics. And I noticed they're mostly on thoroughfares. Like this one's on Glendale, this one's on Colorado, as if they were being stopped. Uh, mostly traffic stops, I'm assuming? Ab absolutely. Uh, many of our, our drug arrests, in fact, the majority of them, are actually self-initiated uh, by patrol officers making traffic or pedestrian stops and then either uh, encountering symptomology or or some other probable cause that leads them to the discovery of, of the narcotics. And then I'm going to slide this over here, and I'm going to go over to the city of Pasadena, and lo and behold, our neighbors to the east, they have crime up here too? They do. They, they do. In fact, uh, there's been a real regional effort to get everybody on, on the same uh, uh, format, so it gives the uh, public a good opportunity to, to compare uh, municipalities. And uh, what uh, is fascinating when you look at this and you compare the city of Glendale with the uh, city of uh, Pasadena, uh, I will give that disclaimer here. If you notice, there are no narcotic uh, icon, narcotic arrest icons with the syringes like we have. Each agency, from what I understand, can dictate what they put that, on there? That's correct. And some agencies have decided only to do part one crimes, which are the major, uh, the six major crimes used for comparative purposes. Uh, we chose, however, after receiving public input, 
to put out all the crimes out there. Uh, we were, again, we are of the opinion that the more information uh, and the better informed the public is, the better they're going to be able to partner with us. So we put it all on, on the website for, for viewing. And just for, uh, I just want to stress this so people are, so I'm going to go slide back over to Glendale here as they're watching us here talk here. But uh, I just want to reinforce that if there is a crime on a particular street, we're not identifying that particular address no. or that specific apartment or anything e like that. Exactly. We have to maintain uh, the confidentiality of victims in, I involved and in, in witnesses involved and in, in such. But uh, it will identify the 100 block where, where the crime occurred, but not a specific address and certainly not any individual identifying information. And uh, there may be an occasion that someone might see within the past week there were three or four police cars and maybe a forensic unit scene, and they look on that particular street, and, and it may not be on there. And the reason why it may not be on there is, is because we've got an ongoing investigation Correct. and it's not going to advertise Correct. to the world. Correct. There will be certain instances where uh, an investigation might be jeopardized if, if it's released publicly. So there may be cases that will be withheld and, uh, until uh, the risk of that jeopardy is, is over. Um, but that will be the exception rather than the rule. In most cases, reported crime will, will uh, be populated on the map in fairly short order. And, and, and to be clear, we're not going to have this veil of secrecy or anything. So if there's something that ever occurs on your block or on your street or at your kid's school or something and you saw the police or the fire department, uh, you can call the fire department or the police department, my counterpart, Captain Vince Rafinho at the fire department, or myself, hey, why were the fire trucks there or why the police cars? You can reach me at 818-548-3140 or my email address and, and ask what's going on and we'll be more than happy to put you at ease, hopefully, to know that uh, we are working on it and we're, we're trying to do something about uh, or solve a crime that had occurred. Anyway, so uh, one of the places that was a fairly quick video, and we've touched on it a little bit, but if you wanted to actually look at a video on how to use it, because this will also break out uh, pie charts, it'll do graphs at the click of a button. You can go to an instructional video at uh, youtube.com and search for crime mapping overview, or if we leave that up long enough, you can copy that string down there at the bottom, uh, youtube.com backslash watch question mark V and so on there. Uh, and it gives a very good instructional video on how to use uh, crime mapping. If, in fact, you still have problems, uh, again, email me uh, at uh, my website, which hopefully they'll put up my email address, and I will send you a link where you can find that information. Chief. That's uh, fantastic. I think we're going to see more of that. I understand LAPD is also going to go in that direction. That's, that's my understanding, yes. So we should have everybody in, in our region eventually should be on this platform. What you're going to love is, uh, what I love is, we've, we've put everything on here, everything. we put all crimes on here. And then when you compare us to other cities that aren't putting everything on there, looks a little different. It looks a little different. We look pretty good because we're putting everything on. They're only putting half the stuff on there. Just pay attention. Oh, in fact, if I go back to that, I guess you can go to the top of the menu and you can click on crime types. And they talked about that earlier. So you can see across the top there, we're talking about arsons, we're talking about assaults, burglary, disturbing the peace, drugs, alcohol violations, DUI drivers, fraud cases, uh, God forbid, a homicide case, motor vehicle theft robbery, sex crimes, theft, larceny, vandalism, vehicle break-in or vehicle burglary, and then weapons. Under the question mark is a, uh, multiple crimes at one location, if you see that. Where you'll see the question mark most often is at the Glendale Police Department, 131 North Isabel Street, because so many people come to the police department to report crimes. So that's why there's a question mark on top of the police department if you ever see that. Well, Chief, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, some of the other new and innovative things that we're working I know you have a little committee uh, that you've put together with a lieutenant, a sergeant, a uh, captain that have been looking at DNA labs. That's right. That's right. And, and this is a, a very important technology for us, Tom. And uh, we are very fortunate to uh, 
present an idea to uh, uh, our, our Congressman Adam Schiff about the idea of doing a regional DNA laboratory, something that would serve uh, Glendale, Burbank, and Pasadena. And uh, through uh, his efforts uh, back in Washington, we were able to uh, to get some substantial grant funding to, to actually start a laboratory here locally. Now, um, in the past, when, when we needed DNA uh, analyzed, we had to go to the Sheriff's Department uh, in the county, and they, they are responsible for doing all the analysis countywide, but uh, that can take some time. And as a result, uh, many times we, we experience delays in terms of uh, getting this evidence that helps us solve crime. The idea of having a local DNA uh, laboratory right here in the Glendale Police Department is uh, that we will do two things. We'll be able to turn DNA analysis evidence around very quickly. So on violent crime, we can get the results in, in very short order, uh, which is very important to in, ensuring uh, those crimes are solved. Uh, but secondly, uh, we'll be able to actually use DNA analysis to, to solve property crimes, which currently we can't do. Uh, that with the uh, uh, great demand for DNA analysis, it's really hard to, to do property crime as well. But with our own lab, we'll be able to do that. And that'll, that'll really help us ensure the type of, uh, of accountability uh, we want for criminal behavior in Glendale. That, you know, that's fascinating because when you hear about DNA today, so much of it uh, it's discussed when you when they really emphasize it, it may, and it makes big news is when um, um, an innocent, an innocent person is released because right. it, it works just as sure does. well for that. And I know we've had cases where it was frustrating where had we had that DNA, we would have been able to make sure that we didn't have the wrong, uh, wrong people in custody yeah. based on the other evidence that was given to us or presented to us. A ab absolutely. And and you know the uh, the public now. When we we look at the different crime shows, CSI Miami, CSI Las Vegas, and CSI wherever, um, major crimes are solved within an hour, <laughs> with four commercial breaks, um, and good DNA evidence. And so we won't be quite that fast. But uh, the issue is is that the public has come to expect uh, crimes to be solved using the latest technology and certainly the utilization of, of DNA evidence. And so to be able to do it more expeditiously here on the local level and apply it to a broader base of crimes uh, will be a wonderful thing for this community. Who are some of the people that you actually have working on this right now? Uh, right now we have uh, Captain Leif Nikolaisen is, is our main uh, project director. Mm -hmm. And working directly uh, for him as the project managers are uh, Lieutenant Carl Povolitis and Sergeant Lola Abrahamian. And they're responsible for, uh, they, they actually went out and, and did a feasibility study after one of our other captains, Captain Ray Eady, worked with Adam Schiff's office to, to get us uh, the money to start this, this process. Um, but they've, they've actually done a feasibility analysis and gone out and visited other uh, small laboratories and, and actually have determined that it, it is indeed very feasible and now we're uh, embarking on, on actual construction drawings and we'll be uh, building the laboratory in very short order. And what is very important for our viewers, uh, our viewers to know is that um, we've, we've received this money, or it's been earmarked for us. Uh, we've actually had some asset forfeiture money, others that we could use too, that uh, once we get this going and use this money to build out and buy the equipment and, and hire the staff that testing may be available for other law enforcement That's agencies. Right. And if I understand, we're going to be able to sustain it, hopefully, because people are going to want to come to us and it'll be like a revenue. And, and, and that would be the plan, that once it's up and running and serving the, the three communities, uh, that there will be an opportunity to even expand the service uh, to other agencies on a, on a, uh, a pay-for-services basis. And right now, we have to rely on every, the outside to get our DNA right now. As a reminder, this is a live call-in show. It's 818-548-3344. Uh, this is your opportunity to talk to Chief Ron DePompa.
Uh, there's uh, We've had some other issues in our community. We talked a little bit about pedestrian safety in the past. It's always a hot topic in the uh, in the community and traffic uh, uh, within the community. It always seems to be the number one. There's a couple PSAs that we'd like to roll and show you as we take a, a couple minute break here. Thank you. I walk to school every day with my friend Liliana. My mom told me we should be careful and watch out for cars. She says a lot of people drive fast in the morning because they're late for school work. They don't always pay attention to the people crossing the street. My mom says don't assume drivers see you. That's why when I come to a crosswalk, I always remember what walking really says. Wait, watch, and walk. Please walk defensively. It may save your life. It's easy to tell if you've had way too many. But what if you've had just one too many? Buzz driving is drunk driving. Powerful uh, public service announcement every 15 minutes. Uh, you know, it's hard to think that someone can be uh, killed uh, as a result of a, a drugged or drunk driver throughout the United States. Actually, I think we've gotten better over the years, and it's a little bit longer than 15 minutes, but it did start that way. Uh, for the students out there, hey, prom is coming and everything like that. Parents, uh, please be aware, and students, uh, don't get sucked into that because uh, you're starting your life. You don't want to end it so early. Uh, so take heed to those uh, warnings there. Chief, some of the other things that we've uh, done is embarked. I know I know. even Jim Starbridge talked about it. I know the city council's talked about it to some extent. But regionalization seems to be very important, not only for us as a community, but for Burbank and Pasadena. I understand we have other programs that we are working together yeah, with them on. Yeah, absolutely, Tom, and you're, and you're so uh, right that that is a very important strategy. Uh, all the municipalities are, are certainly uh, suffering with um, diminishing resources, so the need to partner is greater than ever. And uh, fortunately, we've got uh, a great relationship with uh, uh, both Burbank and Pasadena. Uh, we work well together, um, and we're embarking on some uh, regional projects that I think are going to be very beneficial. An example most recently is that we have uh, partnered with uh, Burbank and Pasadena in providing air support. And uh, as a full-time partner with Burbank and, and now testing uh, that partnership with Pasadena as well. But as you know, helicopters are expensive to fly. And when we can share the cost, we get economies of scale um, and uh, still uh, be able to provide a good service uh, to the three cities. Uh, but, you know, uh, aside from sharing the, the cost on a regional basis, uh, the air support is such a force multiplier. Uh, it's typically the, uh, the first police officers on the scene will be those eyes in the sky. Uh, they'll be able to contain a location, direct responding officers in. 
um, and they're just invaluable in terms of our everyday uh, policing effort. But two, in times of emergencies and disasters, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're irreplaceable. So uh, being able to share uh, with our partners uh, uh, in providing that service, uh, it, it just makes good sense for everybody. And uh, I, I know, because I'm the one that usually gets the phone calls when someone really wants to know, is it really necessary for that helicopter to be over at my house at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning? And uh, I can assure you, and I'm sure you would say the same, that we only have that helicopter over the top of their houses because we're doing something? Exactly. They're responding to a, a 911 call for service, and, and uh, all their, although their, their presence may be a little disrupting, uh, rest assured that uh, they've got a very valid reason and purpose for being there, and the end result will be a safer community. And, and as you said, that it's a force multiplier, so the eyes in the sky there, especially at night with the, uh, the FLIR system where they can see heat, especially with our terrain in the city of Glendale and Burbank and Pasadena, mm -hmm. when you get into some of the neighborhoods with the terrain and everything, you just can't see anything, but with that heat and that vision that you have the capabilities you're going to catch him because you, your neighbor may have called, but you don't want him to end up in your backyard. And I, I want to say one of the uh, toughest things that I have to do is answer a complaint on why when they called the police department, say at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, why the helicopter was overhead. It woke me up and I called in and they said they can't tell me anything or uh, don't worry, everything's okay, but the helicopter's overhead. Just so you know, we don't know who you are sometimes when you're calling us. We do have 911 with reverse. We do have addresses. The reason why we don't tell you uh, what's going on at the time uh, the helicopter's overhead is to make sure that we're not forewarning that suspect out there or a family of the suspect who may be trying to flee between houses to get home that uh, what we're doing and what we're looking at. Uh, so it's just guys, but you can call me the next day. Again, call me or email me, and I'll be more than happy to get you the information. If I don't, I'll make sure my assistant Sherry Servillo will contact you. Um, Chief, with that, we have some uh, very important events coming up. We do. Uh, we have a luncheon coming up that's sponsored by our Glendale Police Foundation, uh, in, in 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 I guess partnership with the Kiwanis Club of Glendale, the Glendale Bar Association. And anyways, it's coming up, uh, I believe, Thursday uh, the 20th. you want to explain what yeah, that event is all about? That's May 20th. And, you know, Tom, this is a wonderful event where, where the community um, really uh, provides a, a forum uh, to recognize uh, not only members of the Glendale Police Department, but members of the community for uh, great contributions over the course of the year. So. Uh, we will be recognizing a variety of, uh, of our own personnel for uh, various uh, um, significant acts that have occurred during the year and significant contributions that individuals have made, uh, but also uh, recognizing community members that have been involved in, in helping us carry out our public safety mission. So this is a wonderful event. It's a great opportunity to get together with the community, and uh, we encourage everybody uh, to come on out and take part in it. Uh, it's, it's not only very interesting, but truly a rewarding uh, experience. Yes, and uh, uh, you, you'd be surprised on how many people that do get recognized. Um, finally, uh, as I said at the beginning of the show, I was a little rusty, I think, after being off the air for a couple of years, but I think we tend to relax a little bit here. Um, I do want to thank GTV6 and the staff here. Yeah. I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, right here, this, new, this station here, GTV6, um, in uh, connection with our program Behind the Badge, we've been lucky enough to win, yes, four Emmys. Uh, this particular one was for uh, recruitment by the Glendale Police Department, uh, given to us uh, by the, uh, the Emmys, uh, and it was back in 2000. And we have uh, three others that we enjoyed working with in collaboration with the staff here at GTV6 without Rich uh, Wells and his staff and the support of uh, city management and city council, I don't think we would have been so lucky and proud. Um, and we hope that we'll be back on the air with some more shows, if not on a regular basis. Maybe we'll be back uh, when there's more important things that we can share with you so you can better partner with us. Uh, but uh, rest assured that if you need to get a hold of us or contact us, don't hesitate to uh, reach out. 
Uh, Chief DePompa, you have an open door policy? Absolutely, we do. And uh, I do know that he does try to make a return phone calls as best he can. Uh, right now, we're going through the budget. Don't expect too much until we get past July because I think, you know, I think my hair is going to be as gray as his here pretty soon after working with him and trying to help him get through the budget process with his command staff. Anyways, I want to thank you for joining us tonight on Behind the Badge. Uh, I hope to see you in the very near future. And from what I understand, if we do get back in the near future, we'll try to talk about some traffic issues here in the city of Glendale. Thank you, and good night.